Yeah, good evening and one and all. And amongst us, we have Mr. S. S. Naganan, senior advocate. The most interesting facet with Mr. Naganan is that he can take you to the wide spectrum of knowledge on different perspectives of law and in fact beyond that also. His knowledge also traverses to the fact that he's an author of books. We did one on the webinar on his book. We will have that deep insight peep also into that. But, and the another fascinating fact with Mr. Nagan on this, that you just call him up late in the night also and say that, sir, there's a lot of request on a particular topic. He doesn't even, I would say that the blink of an eye maybe probably takes more time, but he readily agrees. And since we were re receiving a lot of requests after this COVID being uh, gone and we believe that it is gone for the good and that moratorium period is also over, litigation has started, like everybody was feeling that the Securitization Act, the provisions under the NCLT provisions, under the company's law, et cetera, et cetera, are probably in a limbo or in a suspended state of affairs. But since we are banged back to the business and for a professional to understand the nuances for this aspect has always been quite fascinating. And therefore, as, as we have seen that NCLT's role has grown with the flux of time. Consequently, the role of NCLT in corporate ins insolvencies and reconstruction is an important aspect which we would like to understand from a person whose dedication towards paying back to the society can also be gathered. Today that he's not even in the office, but since he has dedicated to agree to share his knowledge, he's back and back with a bang. And we are enamored by the fact that he has agreed to our request. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you. I hope I'm audible now. <clears throat> okay. In the course of this uh, presentation, you might hear some uh, temple sounds in the background. That's because I'm currently sitting in our uh, ancestral family temple, which is about a uh, 45 minutes drive away from Bangalore. And uh, you might hear some sounds of some pipes and uh, uh, ganta. So uh, please keep that at the back of your mind. Uh, and then let's enjoy the session today. Uh, I think the topic that is selected today is role of National Company Law Tribunal in corporate insolvency and restructuring. I think before I come to this topic, I need to tell you a little bit about the background of uh, insolvency law and then take you through the developments in the law. Now, the earliest uh, company law legislation in India was the 1916 Act of the Indian Companies Act which uh, dealt with a number of issues relating to corporate functioning, structuring, and also about uh, jurisdiction of winding up. Then it was called uh, not insolvency, not restructuring as it's now called, uh, but it was called uh, insolvency proceeding or the winding up proceeding. Now, later on in England, the 1948 English Companies Act was enacted and modeled on that, the first company law legislation which came in India after independence was the 1956 Companies Act. The 1956 Act uh, stood the field for about 50, 60 years till it was replaced by the 2013 Companies Act. Now, the 2013 Companies Act is mainly modeled on the 1956 Act, but it did bring about certain uh, changes, certain modernizations, I would call it, and certain differential procedures. Now, uh, sometime in the late 60s, there was a legislation called the Companies uh, Tribunal. Uh, it was a tribunal that was set up under the Companies Act to adjudicate all disputes which arise under the Companies Act in regard to companies. It was in force for a very short period. And then they realized that uh, the tribunal was not a very happy state of affairs. So finally, the tribunal was abolished. And the jurisdiction which was with the High Court came back to the High Court. In other words, cases which got transferred there came back to the respective high courts. And as all of you might know, the uh, high court, which has jurisdiction over the registered office of a registered company, that is the court which has the jurisdiction to deal with all matters arising under the Companies Act. 
And therefore, if the company was registered anywhere in the state of Karnataka, the Bangalore High Court, Karnataka High Court would be the jurisdiction. Similarly, in other places, if it's Mumbai, then it's the Bombay High Court and so on. So these high courts exercise powers under different jurisdictions. We are, what is uh, uh, connected to our topic today, corporate insolvency and restructuring, they were contained in two sets of provisions. One was section 433 of the 1956 Act. There is a similar parallel provision in the 1913 Act also, which is more or less similar to it, where it vested the power in the company court to wind up a company on the happening of certain events at the instance of certain persons. And there was a large plethora of cases that came up. One of the important grounds on which a company could be ordered to be wound up and declared an insolvent was under Section 433E of the 1956 Companies Act, which said that if a company is unable to pay its debts, then it's liable to be wound up. Now, that was a very simple phrase, which gave rise to a, a large volume of litigation as to what is a debt, is the debt due, how much is the debt? Has there been a default? If so, what are the reason for the default? And is it justifiable? And thereafter, is a counterclaim valid? Supposing the respondent uh, corporate debtor says, yes, I owe him money, but he also owes me money. Is that a claim that would be tenable? And so on. And there was also the concept of a deemed insolvency because section 434 of the 1956 Act contained a provision which said that if a notice is issued to the registered office of a company and the company fails to pay it, pay the debt demanded within a period of three weeks, the company is deemed to be unable to pay its debts. Therefore, a winding up petition would lie. But courts took the view that the, it is not automatic and there's the element of discretion because section 433 starts with the word, the court may wind up a company. Now, why I'm giving you this, the same similar pattern is there in the 2013 Act also with some minor changes, section numbers are different, that's all the changes. Uh, why I'm referring to this background is that uh, the working of the Companies Act, after about uh, that 40 or 50, 40 years or so from 1956, there were rumblings that the cases of insolvency in the High Court are getting enormously delayed. And the courts, are, the high courts are not able to dispose of the matters within a time-bound frame because there is no exclusive jurisdiction of any company judge who sits every day in the week. The volume of work is too large. And in cases where winding up is already ordered, the administration of the insolvent company's affairs was in the hands of the official liquidator. And the official liquidator can uh, ought to have taken steps to realize the monies and uh, distribute it to rateably to persons who are entitled to the money, secured creditors, unsecured creditors, and the body of shareholders, if any, is left. This was the broad scheme, excluding the preferential creditors, about which uh, I, I know not to elaborate now. So that was the role of the official liquidator. And it was found that companies, after an insolvency dissolution, uh, winding up order, it would take five years, 10 years, 15 years for the official liquidator to resolve it and to do something about the affairs, assets of the company. Therefore, it was felt that a separate tribunal should be constituted. Therefore, the company law board was set up. The company law board was an independent tribunal, which was set up under a separate statute. And that all cases which are pending in the high court were transferred to the company law board for disposal under this jurisdiction of corporate insolvency. The company law board also functioned for some time. It had its headquarters as usual of all these tribunals in Delhi. They had a, initially, they didn't have a bench anywhere. Later on, they substituted and had a bench in southern India and Chennai. And of course, in other parts of the country also, they had benches. The company law board also got boiled down into this procedural problems. Then the, the, the functioning of the company law board was found to be not uh, satisfactory and was not completely independent because they exercised not only corporate insolvency jurisdiction, but they exercised many other jurisdictions which the High Court was dealing with. One of the main things being operation and mismanagement, you know, under Section 397 onwards in the 56 Act, Section 241 in the new Act. These are the provisions which the CLB is also dealing with. It was found that the manner in which it was going on was not satisfactory. <laughs> Therefore, the next uh, uh, avatar of the company law board was the National Company Law Tribunal. So this is something which came much later. 
And so the 1956 Act was amended by using the word tribunal and they defined the tribunal as company law board. Whereas the 2013 Act also uses the word tribunal and refers to the National Company Law Tribunal. So this is the historical genesis of the jurisdiction being vested here. Now we see a, a complete change in the methodology of corporate insolvency under the uh, new Companies Act of 1956. Along with that, we must bear in mind that they introduced a separate legislation called the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016. Now, the provisions relating to corporate insolvency and personal insolvency are governed by this uh, act, the new act of 2016. So, I'm going to be dealing with some provisions of this new act and explain to you in brief what is the uh, role of the NCLB. Now, the uh, IBC uh, refers to this authority as the adjudicating authority. So, they don't call it a court or a tribunal. It is the adjudicating authority which will adjudge whether the corporate debtor is insolvent or it's not insolvent. And for that, we need to notice a few of the definitions. Now, Section 2A of the IBC says that it applies to all companies registered in India under any company law act. It might be 56 Act, it might be the 1916 Act or any other enactment. If it's a corporate body, the Act governs it. Two important definitions so far as this topic is concerned is of insolvency. Is, uh, is we find uh, very interestingly two sections devoted in this act for definitions. Normally we have section two in most of the statutes which contains definitions, but here we have two sections, section three and section five. Now the one of the definitions which we have is definition of a financial debt. Now what is a financial debt is defined in subsection eight of five and it says that it includes A, B, C, D, E, F. You know, we all know as lawyers that an inclusive definition means that it is very expansive. It could be very wide and to make it clear they're including something. But the other definition is particular. They say so and so means that means it is confined only to what is stated in the section. But when includes is used, it includes wider things than this. Now includes is also used to put into the uh, framework of the law something which one would not normally think is included in that term. That is the meaning and object of such an inclusive definition. So there is a definition. I'm not going to deal with the details of that definition because the section is very elaborate and it defines who is, what is the commercial financial debt. The second definition is under subsection 21, which refers to an operational debt. Now an operational debt as distinguished, I'll just give you broadly what are the distinctions. In the case of a financial debt, it is a lending by a bank, financial institution, mutual fund, any of these type of institutions, which are mainly meant for financing corporate bodies. These are financial debts. Operational debt is in the course of a company's business. It is carrying on in many activities. It has many trade creditors. It has bought goods. It has yet to pay them. There could be other liabilities. These are all liabilities which arise in the course of operations of the company. These are all not by a financial creditor. So they are all called operational debts. There is a distinction as to what is the procedure in the case of financial debt and operational debt. The distinction between this act and the old companies act is the old companies act did not make a distinction between a financial debt and an operational debt. It was just a debt. Anybody could be, it could be a bank. It could be a financial operational debtor also. Whereas here they make a distinction and the subsequent provisions make a special provision as to how this should be conducted. For example, Section 7 talks of a petition for insolvency resolution by a financial creditor. So if a financial debt is due, the person to whom the debt is due is a financial creditor and the financial creditor can move the court by a procedure which is indicated in the section itself. Now, the minute such a petition is filed, within 14 days, the NCLT, the adjudicating authority, has to decide whether to admit this petition or no. Whereas there was no such time limit under the old act. So there is now an element of expedition that has to be followed by this NCLT. Now, what is a default is also defined in section 7, subsection 5. And it only says that if a notice is given and within the time prescribed of 14 days, if there is no dispute that is already existing, supposing 100 rupees is demanded, 
and the creditor says no no not 100 i don't owe 100 rupees i don't owe any money i filed a case there's an arbitration proceeding relating to this claim then there is a sufficient defense for the financial uh, debt uh, creditor not to proceed under section 7 so the adjudicating authority can say this is a pre existing dispute therefore i am not going to go forward and dismiss the petition now in the case of an operational creditor section 8 refers to it and there you must uh, if a notice is issued by an operational creditor which is a must before you institute the case the uh, creditor has a 10 day window within which it must either raise a dispute or there must be can, a case pending before the issuance of the notice so you can't cook up a defense and cook up a case now if there is a default in the 10 days period then section 9 says that the uh, adjudicating authority which is nclt can go forward and go to the next step now under the old companies act there was a long procedure under which a company would have to go through a procedure the court would hear both parties find out if a prima facie case is made out and if the prima facie case meant is it prima facie established that the debt is due in which event the court would admit the petition and advertise it in the newspapers after that the hearing will go on if necessary evidence will be taken that is the procedure now it is not like that the minute the adjudicating authority comes to the conclusion that here is a case where insolvency resolution process has to go forward they admit it and uh, they will appoint what is called as an interim resolution professional there are elaborate rules for this in the petition itself the petitioner is supposed to give the name of the proposed insolvency resolution professional and there is a regulation of the regulatory authority for this purpose insolvency regulation board which uh, provides for an examination and enlistment of various professionals who can go through that process and get enlisted as insolvency resolution professional once you are enlisted then you are eligible to be appointed so the petitioner is required to explain and put in the name of one insolvency resolution professional who will automatically be appointed as the interim resolution professional so the interim resolution professional there are strict rules for that within 14 days he has to advertise he has to correct all the information and thereafter within 180 days from the date of admission that is the date the insolvency resolution professional interim resolution professional is appointed within 180 days six months he the entire case has to be completed there is a there is a provision for extension and there are some strict conditions for that the committee of creditors has to approve it in which event it can be extended by a maximum of 90 days so that means you are looking at 270 days maximum period before it is decided whether the company can be uh, restructured it can be corporate insolvency can be taken care of by various means that are there in that or it cannot be done now what is it that is supposed to happen in this 180 or 270 days is what is provided in the next uh, provisions but before that you must notice section 13 and 14 which says that the minute an insolvency uh, interim resolution professional is appointed the nclt will order a moratorium on all actions against this corporate debtor see because if one person is before the insolvency court if other people go to court get an order of attachment get an order of bank account attachment stoppage of activities then it becomes difficult to go forward with the resolution of the corporate insolvency therefore there is a moratorium there is a whole host of laws a somewhat similar provision was there in the sikh industrial company special provisions act of 1985 where it provided that the minute uh, you know the, the, this uh, new ibc is a kind of a what should i say a hybridization of the sikh industrial act companies act ibc all of them put together so the scheme is different anyway there was a moratorium there here also there is a moratorium now what is it this interim resolution professional has to do is within 14 days he must uh, uh, give a report and uh, his duties are all enumerated what he should do how he can do how he can take charge of the company's affairs etc but the most important role in the restructuring of any corporate body today in insolvency proceeding is that a committee of creditors is to be formed now ultimately this company in insolvency as we all know 
the whole object is that when a body or a person is insolvent, his estate will be vested and taken over by some independent receiver or independent administrator. Because it cannot be left to the insolvent company to do itself, because it may prefer somebody, it may do something wrong. Therefore, it goes into the hands. In this case, it will go into the hands of an interim resolution professional. And later, it goes into the hands of a resolution professional who is more or less permanent till the matter goes into liquidation. Now, this uh, resolution professional or the interim resolution professional will constitute a committee of creditors which is all the financial creditors of the company will be part of that committee. So if a company has, let us say, six financial institutions or other financial creditors who have advanced monies to the company, based on the information provided, they will determine, the IRP has to determine who are members of this credit. Supposing the total amount is 100 rupees, the total liability of this company. This may be due to about uh, 10 persons. Different sums are due. So the committee of creditors will comprise of everybody to whom this 100 rupees is due. And in proportion to your respective debt, you have a voting right. So one important aspect on which again, there has been quite a number of cases, litigation before NCLT, NC Appellate Authority and the Supreme Court is that there was an exclusion of a related person. Now in this uh, list of con uh, uh, committee of creditors, if a person comes within the definition of related person as defined in the act, because the act defines who is a related person, those persons cannot form part of the committee of creditors. The reason being that if they are related to the promoters of the company or the company in any manner, the body of creditors decision will not be independent because the decision, what should happen to this company if a scheme is propounded, that is say the management comes and says that, you know, we would like to pay this in such and such a manner. We would like to stop this activity. We would like to sell some asset. All these are parts of the resolution scheme that can be presented to the committee of creditors. When the committee of creditors examines it, interested persons cannot be there and voting on the scheme. Then there may be, uh, what shall I say, backdoor fixation of the result of the committee of creditors. So they are excluded that these uh, related persons. Then there must be majority voting. Section 21 says, that the committee of creditors will adjudicate, will vote on this aspect, on the issue relating to the restructuring by a simple majority of votes. And those votes are proportionate to the sum that is due to each of those creditors. Then the, the role of the resolution professional comes at that stage when he has to then place this matter, the resolution plan as approved by the committee of creditors before the uh, adjudicating authority, which is the NCLT. Now the NCLT, again, there are cases on the point as to what NCLT can do, what it cannot do. And the general view has been that the wisdom of the committee of creditors is something which the uh, NCLT does not sit in appeal over, unless there is some procedural irregularity or there is some other legal issue that is involved. Usually the decision of the committee of creditors has to be accepted by the adjudicating authority. And what is it that they can do? Now, I'll give one example. Supposing a company, it has got some large number of creditors. It comes forward and a resolution plan says that uh, all the creditors will be paid 50% of their debt. And uh, this money will be raised by the sale of this entire undertaking to a person who comes and bids. I, am, I want to buy this company. So I say, okay, I have assessed it. I'm going to give 1000 rupees to buy this company. The company has liabilities of uh, say 2000 rupees. I'll say I'll give 50% to every creditor. This is a proposal, the resolution plan, which will be placed before the committee of creditors. And if the committee of creditors accepts this resolution plan and votes on it with a 51% majority, then this is placed before the adjudicating authority, which can in turn then say, yes, we accept this resolution plan. If for some reason the resolution plan is not uh, accepted by the committee of creditors, then a report goes to the adjudicating authority to say there was a scheme, but it didn't pass muster with the requisite majority. Therefore, nothing can be done to revive this company. What should be done next is that it should go in for liquidation. The NCLT will then have to make an order to say that there is no uh, uh, resolution plan that is possible. This company is insolvent. It is not able to pay its debts. Therefore, there is no option but to order the liquidation of this company. 
and the resolution professional will become the liquidator of this company and once he becomes a liquidator the rest of the provisions are more or less akin to what is there in the companies act itself as to the priority how this uh, list of creditors should be drawn up and how uh, assets should be realized and a host of other provisions and finally at the end of all of that supposing they sell all the assets and the total liabilities are 1000 rupees he releases realizes only 500 rupees which is not sufficient to discharge all the creditors of the company he pays them rateably and then says well nothing more can be done please dissolve the company and an order of dissolution can be passed there are the usual powers of fraudulent preference and transfer of assets illegal activities prior to the dissolution process all of that can be gone into but finally if there's no solution at the end Uh, the company has to be dissolved and there is an order of dissolution that is made one other uh, new provision which we have in this nclt uh, the regulations is section 56 which talks of a fast track corporate insolvency resolution you saw in the earlier it was 180 days if they opt for a fast track then it could be 90 days the time available is 90 days now one other important aspect which comes up in most resolution cases is what happens to the secured creditors you know as we all know if a company has uh, let's say a liability of 2000 rupees out of that 1000 rupees is due to a bank and the bank holds a mortgage over the property of a company let's say its factory is mortgaged to the bank what are the rights of the secured creditor say the secured creditors dues are 1000 rupees and uh, if the value of that uh, security is uh, 500 rupees then the secured creditor has a right to say i am not going to join the liquidation proceeding winding up proceeding insolvency resolution proceedings i want to stand outside winding up i want to take charge over this asset maybe i will take recourse to securitization act maybe i will take recourse to debt recovery provisions under the recovery of debts due to banks act whatever other remedies i have i would like to enforce them so that my security i would like to encash it in the manner known to law and if i realize more than 500 rupees i will pass on the rest to the body of creditors if i realize less then i am satisfied with that for the balance if any i will stand along with the other unsecured creditors in the list proportionately pro rata i should get it so such provisions are there in section 52 of the act i must draw attention to one or two important cases that have come up in the interpretation because this is a new legislation it has gone to supreme court quite often it's a 2016 enactment and uh, one of the earliest cases which went to supreme court is the innovative case which is reported in 2018 one supreme court cases 407 and a later case called swiss ribbons in 2019 four supreme court cases page 17 in both these cases the question involved was what is the discretion available to the nclt when it comes to dealing with petitions by financial creditors the supreme court has noticed the language and the scheme of this new act is such that there is not much elbow room available to the corporate debtor to maneuver and delay things the minute a financial creditor says that this much money is due and that is borne out because now you have a national credit registry and all that there is a long procedure that has to be followed if you follow all that procedure and come to court there is very little defense that the corporate credit debtor can actually have there is a, ultimately banks dues are all borne out by records they have got bank statements there will be demand there will be confirmation of balance there will be documentation there will be mortgage there will be registration of charge it will be in the register of charges it will be in the national registry of uh, debts all of this will show that the sum is due so the scope for maneuvering is very very limited and that is what the innovative and the swiss ribbons case the supreme court had occasion to deal with it and settle it so in sum and substance so far as insolvency is concerned in the resolution process this is the broad scheme of the act i would say that it is a, a it is a, a change for the good but i must uh, say with uh, some disappointment that the manner in which the uh, national company law tribunal has been formed and is functioning leaves much to be deserved the tribunal is never filled up fully there are not sufficient benches there are not sufficient members of the tribunal the registries are not properly uh, uh, manned and uh, it is beset with innumerable delays and procedural problems as a result these time frames are never followed 
Now, the interesting uh, thing about time frame is all these 180 days and other time frame that is indicated, it starts ticking from the date of admission of the petition. So, if a petition is filed today, there is no time limit for the NCLT to decide whether to admit or not to admit. So, we see huge, enormous delays, sometimes running to more than two, three years, till the NCLT decides that this petition is to be admitted. The minute it is admitted, then this time starts ticking. And uh, I find in many cases, this time frame is actually counterproductive because sometimes in one case, the uh, RP knew that this committee of creditors were not properly constituted, but he was uh, time bound. So he said, I can't do anything. Let's go ahead with the meeting. Meeting went ahead. Uh, resolution passed, uh, accepting an offer made by somebody. Then it goes back to NCLT where he says, he comes and tells the NCLT, see, I went all this way forward because of the time frame. Now I find that the committee is not properly constituted. So please, you know, restart the whole process. This is the stage at which it is there. So I'm saying sometimes these time frames have a counterproductive effect. And that's what is happening in many cases. But most of the time, this time frame, I must say with my experience, limited experience in NCLT, these time frames are never followed. And uh, that is because of the huge amount of pendency of cases. One other important change that is brought, brought about under the IBC, you know, in the past, as I was mentioning, the official liquidator is the one who has full jurisdiction over companies which were ordered to be wound up under the old act. And he was an officer of the court. He was a senior officer in the company law department, and he had a separate office attached to the high court. And he was under administrative control of the company judge. Now they've done away with that process. They have now vested it in independent professionals who have to follow a certain regimen to get registered. And once they do that, they become IRP or RP as the case may be. So they, they are also regulated in terms of professional ethics and other things. So these are independent persons to whom a remuneration is to be payable. There is a fixation of remuneration. Like they are private parties who are doing the public job of administrating insolvent companies because Traditionally, insolvency legislations provided that once a person is insolvent, his estate will vest in the state, which is administered through a receiver or whatever as the case may be. Now it is resting in independent uh, professional. There are some plus and minus points there, but uh, I think there is uh, something that can be said to support it, but there are many things that we said to not support it. But uh, I'm not going to deal with that, but this is anyway one of the issues that is a, some sort of a bugbear and uh, it is it is somehow not being very uh, efficiently done, very properly done is what I feel. The next aspect of the uh, topic today is on uh, restructuring. Now, if you go back again to Companies Act of 1956, it had a provision in section 391 onwards, which said that a company can enter into an arrangement with its shareholders or creditors. And there was a procedure, you would file an application and that application would be approved by the company judge. Meetings would be held. A scheme would be placed before the members. Same scheme would be placed if it is going to affect the secured creditors before them and the unsecured creditors. Voting would take place. You needed three fourths majority. And once you did that, the matter would go back to the company court after a public notice. And after notice to central government and official liquidator, if it is necessary, the companies or one of them is ordered to be wound up, then income tax department and the matter would, the company judge would decide the matter. Now, the same set of provisions are contained in the new Companies Act because these provisions relating to restructuring is something which is not in the IBC because this is a case where a company is not insolvent. When a company is not insolvent and it wants to restructure itself, either to retire some debt, reduce some capital, or enter into a compromise with creditors, tell them, look here, if you allow this company to uh, its, uh, liquidation, you will get only 20 rupees in a hundred rupees. So if you allow me to restructure, I'm assuring you, I'll give you 50 rupees at least. So this type of structures are possible. So the new Companies Act more or less proceeds on the basis of the old section 391. The new sections are 230 to 236 of the Companies Act of 2013. The broad scheme is more or less the same. The procedure is more or less the same. Instead of going to the uh, company court, that is high court, you would now go to the NCLT. And there is a large procedural, it's largely procedural, 
But the important thing to be noted is that this uh, restructuring, restructuring could be two things. You either retain the company as it is and restructure the debt and allow the company to continue, subsist and revive itself. Or you merge this company with somebody else, with some other company. So it's a scheme of amalgamation. So many times a merger takes place to take over a company which is ailing. A healthy company enters into a compromise and an amalgamation proceeding with a not so healthy company. By which process is a win-win situation. The healthy company is getting a good asset company if it's so assessed like that. The unhealthy companies, which is about to be closed because it has no means of sustenance, their shareholders and creditors have a ray of hope because their obligations are taken over by the new company. Of course, there are provisions. The scheme of amalgamation will have to contain. What is it that the sacrifices to be made by which batch of creditors? Is it secured creditors? Is it unsecured creditors? How much are they each sacrificing? And what about the shareholders? If the shareholder is holding 100 shares, maybe the scheme will provide that he will get only uh, 50 shares in the new company. There is a share valuation that is done. And in the valuation exercise, the net share value of each share of the transferor and the transferee companies are seen. Thereafter, a proportion is worked out, a chart accountant's report is looked into. And this is placed before the members because members, secured and unsecured creditors, three separate meetings have to be held. And they will then decide whether it is fit and suitable to accept this. Now, the voting takes place. Again, in the case of shareholders, one vote per share. In the case of creditors, one vote per rupee. That's how the voting takes place. So 75% approval is needed. Once that is done, if there is a sectoral regulator, like for example, if you're a company which is in a stockbroking business, there's a sectoral regulator, which is SEBI. If you're a real estate company, the sectoral regulator is the RERA. No, like this for each sector, there is a, if you're a banking company, the sectoral regulator is the RBI. So there is a sectoral regulator for many of these things. If there is a secular regulator, sectoral regulator, that regulator will also be participating in this because their views will be considered after the members and the shareholders and the creditors approve it. And once that is done, the matter goes before the adjudicating authority, which is the NCLT, which plays the role of a supervisor. Now, what is the role of the supervisor has been the subject matter of many decisions. And one of them, the earlier decisions of Mafatlal, where the Supreme Court said, that uh, the role of this, uh, then they were concerned with the court, now it is the NCLT, is not to act in as an appellate authority. Ultimately, the persons who are stakeholders, they are the people who decide what is the fate of their company. So if all procedural regulations are followed, law is not violated, then the court or the regulator here, that is the NCLT, has no right to say, no, no, I think this scheme is not fair, so I want to approve it. That is the role, but just to oversee and ensure that law is followed. That seems to be the object of the amalgamation proceedings under the old act, which is similarly applicable under the new act. One other important thing, which is again parallelly common, is there may be a small dissenting number of shareholders. Supposing 90% of the shareholders approve it, 10% vote against it. In which case, the scheme can make a provision to say that this 10% who do not want to participate in this uh, amalgamation or this restructuring, for them, we make a separate provision. Those shareholders may be paid so much per share as a result of which their share will get extinguished. I'm just saying this could be one such thing. Second is those 10% shareholders will be paid some X amount of rupees per share. Like these many things could be there. So the order of the NCLT can provide as to what should happen to these dissenting members if any dissent should be exercised. And also, there is another separate provision in Section 236 of the uh, Companies Act of 2013, which provides for some order to be made to purchase the minority shareholders. Supposing there is a small group in the illustration is giving 10% are not agreeable. What should happen to those 10%? There is a provision to provide that those shares of those 10% will be purchased by someone else or by the company itself by means of an order made under the section itself without the company having to go for reduction of capital, which is a different procedure and the old section 100. It's a parallel provision in the new act also is there. So these are the provisions relating to restructuring of a company. The restructuring can be, as I said, by means of reduction of the debt, 
by means of reduction of the capital, by means of repayment of some capital, by means of buying out minority shareholders. All these are to be debated in, in terms of the procedure that is provided in the Companies Act under the nose and supervision of the NCLT. My experience is that because of the specialization of the members of the NCLT, many times they come precisely to the question. And if you satisfy them that the requirements have been fulfilled, it's a matter of procedural uh, approval. It's a more or less uh, uh, you know, easily done, provided you follow all the procedures. And the same thing was happening in the Companies Act also. You know. Many company judges before whom we have appeared in for so many years, they came to the point straight away and one, two, three, four checklists they had, finished all these things, all approvals granted. Okay, if there's some dissenting member, we'll hear you. What is it that you want to say? Are you going to be better off or worse off? And then take a decision as to what should happen to this company. So I think these are the provisions which we have in matter relating to corporate insolvency and restructuring. I think I've come to the end of my time, which was uh, 45 minutes. Thank you for a patient hearing. It's time for a few questions if yeah. uh, anybody wants to ask. So since you have taken us to the Swiss judgment, etc., and there has been a lot of debate as to whether it resolves the matter for all times to come. For a person who is to understand the backdrop of these NCLT, etc., there are a lot of judgments, especially by Justice Ronington, on these aspects. <clears throat> and rightly said that the endeavor of the government is quite in a positive direction. But yes, if the uh, contribution towards the bar and the bench for its early disposal is also a prerequisite. And while if we take this, uh, these webinars and seminars to understand the things, if one understands the procedure, it becomes quite easy. Well, one aspect according to uh, the people would be, <laughs> what would be the aspect because a lot of people, since they are youngsters also, how, how is the interest uh, done in the case of a secured creditor and an unsecured creditor in the NCLT matters. Is it the same or is it same like the company's matter? No, I think, you know, the, the role of the secured and unsecured creditor and their rights, they are not uh, disturbed. Only distinction is this, that in the, in the earlier procedure before the IBC, the, at the stage of admission of the petition, the creditors had no role to play. The general body of creditors. Same thing here also. At the stage of admission of the petition, the petitioning creditor, whether he is secured or unsecured, depending on whether he is a financial creditor or an operational creditor, the court will look into it. And if it finds there is a debt which is not paid, it will admit it. At that stage, the rest of the body of creditors don't come into the picture. Same situation as it prevailed then. But once this admission happens, the procedure is completely different now under the new IBC. Under the old provisions, what would happen was the court would then issue a public notice and hear anybody who comes, including the creditors. Now, if other creditors came and said, sir, don't wind up this company, the court would then ask them, well, you see, this debt is not paid. The company has no means of payment and therefore it is insolvent. If you don't wind it up, what will happen to the creditor who has come to court? Who will pay him? Are you going to pay him? Many times the workers come and oppose. The court asks, well, I have my sympathy with you because in the PR Ramakrishnan versus NTC case in 1983 or so, Supreme Court said, workmen have a right to be heard in winding up proceedings. Yes, they can be heard, but what will they say? So in the new uh, procedure under the IBC, the role of the court or the NCLT is reduced. What happens now is the ball goes into the uh, court of the committee of creditors. So when the committee of creditors is formed, the committee of creditors will decide whether there is any chance of revival of this company or there is no chance. If there is no chance, then the next step of liquidation proceeds automatically because if no resolution plan is approved, nothing can be done except to wind up the company, liquidate the company. So then the procedure will go on. The only small distinction is in this committee of financial, the finan committee of creditors, the financial creditors play the major role. The role played, there is no role for the operational creditors. Say in the example I was giving, supposing the company has a debt of 1,000 1, rupees. In 1,000 rupees, 800 rupees or 700 rupees is let us say due to financial creditors, banks, institutions, long-term lenders, all of them. 
300 rupees is due to operational creditors, people who supply you goods, people who give you services whom you have not paid, etc. Now, in the new dispensation, the operational creditors of 300 rupees, they have no role in the decision making process of the committee of creditors. Similarly, any interested person who may be interested in the company as a director, former director, relative of a director, relative of majority shareholder, they also have no role. So it's an independent body of financial creditors who call the shots. If they accept a resolution plan, then the resolution professional will go forward and place it before the adjudicating authority. And those who are not in agreement with it certainly have a right of audience there. They can come and say, don't approve it for this reason, that reason. But the role of the adjudicating authority there is very limited. The discretion is not there. Same, whereas in the old companies act, there's a famous passage in farmer company law, where the question was, the section says may wind up a company. What is the meaning of may? It means there's a discretion. Company can still say, I won't wind up. It doesn't say shall wind up. What is that element of discretion? The, dis the discussion of the leading textbook says, may wind up means, unless there are very good and compelling reasons as to why this company should not be wound up, the company court is bound to wind it up. If no such good reasons are there, it is also bound to wind it up. So I think we are more or less on the same lines. But the distinction is that in the decision-making process here, it is the financial creditors who call the shots. Uh, for a youngster, uh, we would like also to understand what is the role of uh, this RP? RP is a very important role. As I explained, initially, at the time of admission, an interim resolution professional is appointed. What he does is, he or she, they'll collect the data, they'll go to the company, collect all the information, and they will look into the records and give a report to the adjudicating authority, which is NCLT. In that report, it will he will specify who are the creditors, the committee of creditors, and what are the state of affairs. The IRP also has a right to look into, supposing this is a running company, salary has to be paid, bank account has to be operated, all those things the IRP can do. Once the committee of creditors is formed, then the committee of creditors, the, the, the shepherding of the committee of creditors is all done by the resolution professional. He is the next level. The resolution professional, it could be the same IRP who becomes the RP, but RP could be independently appointed also. So it's again another registered professional. The RP's role is to take it forward from the committee of creditors, then submit a report to the adjudicating authority, that is NCLT, and thereafter look after the affairs till a decision is made. If the resolution plan is sanctioned, then the and the adjudicating authority approves it, then the RP's role is over, he gets his money and he goes home. But if it is not approved and the NCLT orders the liquidation of the company, then the RP will continue and the RP will continue to be the liquidator of the company unless the adjudicating authority orders otherwise. That is the distinction in the role of these two. The number of powers of the RP and the IRP are there. The sections provide exactly what they have to do. But in, in, in common parlance, I can say, they will substitute the board of directors. Whatever the board could do, the IRP and the RP can do. But subject to the overall supervision of the adjudicating authority and the provisions of law. The act itself contains. This is, uh, the name is not coming. What is the discretionary power of the NCLT in relation of approving of a valuation report in case of a merger? Uh, if there is a valuation report that is given in a merger proceeding, in a restructuring or an amalgamation proceeding, that uh, valuation report is to be placed before the three bodies of decision makers, the shareholders, the secured creditors and the unsecured creditors. Once that is placed before them, taking note of the valuation in that, if appropriate majority of three-fourth is voting in favor of the scheme, then the role of the adjudicating authority or the NCLT is very minimal. They can't say that this uh, report is uh, not correct, incorrect, because that is not their role. The decision makers are the three affected persons. And once they have made up their mind, it should be final. And if somebody is dissenting, there is a provision to make an order so far as dissenting persons are concerned. 
that is something which they can uh, you know uh, fashion it in that fashion in the order uh, this is keshav he says what is the value of prior order by rera authority ordering revocation of project registration and assignment of project completion to independent authority under the initiation of cirp see the the rera orders are something to do with the running of the business they the, the 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 fact that the company is facing rera proceedings and there are some orders passed in rera is a very important fact which has to be placed before the committee of creditors in the resolution plan see whoever see if there was a real estate company it has got 10 projects in two projects rera authority has revoked the plan and given some directions how to revive this company these two projects must also be taken note of and to see how it can be done of course there is a slight aberration in the law now as it stands see very uh, i would say respectfully say a very incorrect order has been passed by the nclat in two matters which has been uh, commented upon and uh, you know disagreed by a bench of the madras uh, tribunal where they said that in a real estate company if the company has three projects the cirp can go on regard to one project and not uh, involve the other projects i don't know how that's possible because the cirp is not project wise the cirp is for the whole company now you cannot bifurcate it like that so the answer to the question is that if some project has been commented upon or ordered by rera that is a very important facet which has to be included in the resolution plan noticed and included and a resolution of that also should be proposed what are they proposing to do for that uh, uh, this is what is there any distinction between uh, rp and irp irp as i told you is initially appointed in the petition itself the petitioning creditor must give the name of a person to be appointed as irp they have to give a certificate saying he is not disqualified he is agreeable on that once it is there usually the nclt will appoint that named person as the interim resolution professional the interim resolution professional takes charge forthwith steps into the shoes of the board collects all the material and formulates the committee of creditors once that is done the matter goes back to the adjudicating authority that's nclt with a request to appoint now a resolution professional so the interim can get converted to a resolution professional or a new person can be appointed because from that stage onwards the resolution professional takes over like we have been talking about i am just taking few questions for a common person to understand it says that uh, what is the actually the role of a rp resolution professional in a nclt matters see the role of an rp is as i'm saying they step into the shoes of the board of directors of the company the board of directors is superseded so whatever if supposing let's say a company is it's got a factory it's got uh, say uh, 200 employees it's got a running business now the irp is supposed to substitute the board and take all decisions relating to running tomorrow whether they should produce a or b or c whether they should uh, collect money from x y z whether they should pay electricity bill who should operate the bank account all of this is like a receiver in a civil action everything is vested in him with powers and what his powers are are clearly stipulated in the act itself what he can do section 18 talks of the duties of the irp so uh, he literally steps into the shoes of the board of directors that's what i can say this is what after the amalgamation is effected and moratorium is lifted what will happen to the money recovery suit against the old entity can it continue against the newly formed entity normally in all amalgamation proceedings they insist on a provision in the scheme itself which normally it is included to say that any proceeding by or against a company which is under amalgamation will be continued by or against the transferee company which takes over all this unless such a provision is there the scheme will not be approved at all so if there is a proceeding against a company which is amalgamating and the amalgamated company will step into the shoes of the amalgamating company and all obligations will be of them only of the amalgamated company because most of the time the amalgamating company will be ordered to be uh, uh, dissolved without winding up because everything is taken over there is no asset left no obligation left so we have discussed the entire topic along with the questions and we are thankful for you uh, thankful to you for sharing your knowledge and that to 
despite the fact that you had come come to the temple, but because we all are in the temple of justice, to understand that the right knowledge flows from the right fountain. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Thank you.